So I get to the second to the last key and it opens it. So I'm relieved. And um, I start going through the process of pulling the card out. I pull the card out. You have to go through a sequence of buttons. You pull a switch. And then you put a new card in. And you, you pull, turn the switch on and that takes a second to arm. Well, during that time where I had the new card in and I pushed the button for it to arm, I have my head down because I'm like fully engaged in this camera right now. Before that, I was lifting up and scanning every between every key because I there was something there breaking a twig or whatnot. And this time I'm focused on it because I wanted to get this thing done. So right when I'm waiting for it to arm, I'm looking down and keep in mind that before the noise was noise was coming to like my northwest. I think it was it was to the, to my right, and it's fully open going that way. I can see 70 yards. And then to my left, it's all brush. There's n I can't see anywhere. I can't see three yards this way. But I can see in front of me, just as far as I can see to the left. And, and nothing came in. Nothing moved in this zone that I could see in. Every time I lift my head up, there was nothing there. I never heard a noise of anything walking or moving. I just heard snap, snap twigs. And I heard that, <coughs> that snort sound. And then uh, when I'm about ready to... Uh, any millisecond the camera is going to be ready for me to arm it i hear uh <sighs> like a hears exhale groan growl and it's right in front of me it's it's like right in front of me and I, my head's down i'm wearing a red hat i'm wearing a, a flannel shirt a, a quilted flannel white and black flannel shirt blue jeans and a red uh, i think it's a, a cabela's hat and it, it's got a blue c on it and i and i start to uh I, I knew what I'm going to see because we had been researching this site for over a year and we never got pictures of bears. We never saw a track of a bear. And this is like a really deep gruntle groan growl. It's like I could sense that this thing was heavily disgusted in me when it did it. I could feel the disgust in the growl and it was deep and low and long and loud. Right. And it's like really close to me. I'm like, I'm so scared right now. I'm literally crapping my pants. This thing is literally on top of me and I never heard it go there. And I have my head down like this and I know I'm about, I'm going to look up and I'm going to see it and it's going to be right in my face. And I start to lift up my hat. And as I'm lifting up my head, I can start to see it come up under the brill of my hat. And it knows I'm going to see it as I'm lifting up my hat, because as I'm lifting my head up, it starts ducking. And it, and it goes from fully standing up, because as soon as I get my hat up, it's fully standing there and it starts to go down. And it's fully standing up right next to this alder tree that's like 20 yards in front of me. It's just to the side of it. And it's like eight feet tall and its shoulders are about five feet wide, I would say. And it, and it huge, the thing is as wide, the shoulders are wider than the windshield of your car back there. I'm not joking. And the head is just a bob, a bob like a, a nub on top of the shoulders between the body. And I could see stuff stuck in its hair, like sticks and stuff, like debris had literally like stuck in its hair, like camouflage. It was in, on its shoulders and its back. I didn't really see the back, but then as soon as it, it knew as I can see it, it went down to this motion where it, it squatted and then it shifted to the left. Like you would see a gorilla go down on all fours where like it would put its, front ar its arms in front of it between its legs. It did that where it was facing me the whole time. It never lowered its head. It was looking at me and it dropped down to a squatting position and it shot to that, um, well, it shot to its right, my left. It just shot to the left, like shuffled. But it did it unnaturally fast and without a sound, and with no sound, not not any sound, no, no sound. It was completely silent when it moved. And it did it so fast that that's the one thing that stuck in my mind. I was just like, holy shit, this thing. I'm a tactical thinker. I'm, I was on the SWAT team for five years. I was still on the SWAT team when this happened. I was a detective for five years. When I look at any situation, I think tactically because that my life depended on it, right? I'm always thinking about scenarios, especially when I was in that job of what could happen here, what could happen, how will I escape? If this happens, I mean, always considering 100 scenarios for every call you go to because you got to consider all possibilities, right? So... This is unfolding in front of me. I'm seeing this massive threat predator in front of me and it shifts to the side and it's doing it unnaturally speed. And the first thing I know, cause I was a sprinter in high school. I ran the hundred and the 200 and the four by one relay. And um, I was a fast runner. I was like one of the fastest people in my school. I looked at this thing move to the left and it's 20 yards. And I knew in my mind right then, if I turn and run, it's gonna be on me in two seconds if it wants me. Two steps, I won't make it further than that. It'll be on me and that's it. And I thought it was flanking me because it moved towards my car. First thing in my mind, I thought, okay, this thing's flanking me. 
it knows that my car's over here and I'm going that way. So it's going to head me off. It's going to get me. I, I'm thinking I'm dead, right? I'm thinking there's no way I'm out of here alive. And so instead I decide I'm not going to my car. I'm going straight for the road because that's the quickest route out of here to get to some sort of safety because I'll be on the main road in the open. And so I went straight and I went right through the blackberry briars and I got on the road and I started hyperventilating. I made it to my car and I broke into tears immediately. And I drove like the 12, 15 minutes home and I got home and my, I guess my face was white as a ghost. My wife asked me what happened to me. I said I just had a Bigfoot encounter <laughs> at Harstein Island. And I went and I called everybody I knew. I think I called Jeff Meldrum. I called Wally Hersom and I called Derek and I called uh, Dave Politis. I called like 10 people and I told them everything that happened. I said, I'm done with this shit. I ain't doing this no more. You know, I'm, I'm finished. I was freaked out. I mean, I was scared. This impacted me heavily. I was like, I felt like I was prey. This thing was emotionally built up. You know, obviously these things built this whole incident up emotionally. They built it up as high as, as big as they could get it because they wanted maximum effect out of it. At least that's what I thought after this because they scared the living shit out of me. And um, I thought they were going to kill me. I thought I was dead. You know, these things ambushed me. They were waiting for me to come that day. And then they taught me a lesson. That's kind of what I thought. And I went through, went through my mind for a while that I'm quitting, I'm doing all this, you know, and then I thought I can't, I'm right where I want to be. I put all this work and effort in to get to this point where I'm at right now and I'm here and I can't abandon it now. I can't, it doesn't matter how scared you are, you got to just do it because you've worked too hard to get to this point. You're right where you want to be. You have, you see it, she's seen, seen it today. It was right in front of you. It was waiting for you to show up, you know, and nothing was on the cameras on any of them, right? Nothing. And I had like five other cameras in there back behind where I had cameras between where the two things where they were. I mean, I mean, we could talk about cameras. I've they walk through it like nothing. They don't care about the cameras. The cameras don't bother them at all. I don't think I think they do in general. I think my presence was bothering them more than the cameras, to be honest. But here nor there. Um, so basically, you know, what happened was the fact that. I was going to quit and then and then I couldn't because I had to keep going because I had invested too much into it and I was so close to what I was trying to get to, you know. And keep in mind that there's a huge piece of this story that I'm not even telling you about the the genome study and 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 that stuff of my involvement that happened during this and before this incident at Harstein. But so I'm backing out of it and I'm telling everybody I'm going to quit and and uh nobody would go with me back that day. To look for tracks but the next day i got this guy rob johnson to go who was a uh, uh, one of the members of our project and in fact where i was hearing all the noise the twigs breaking and the <laughs> i found all kinds of 14 inch tracks back there they were going back and forth on this little knob and in the duff and so we couldn't get anything that you could cast it was just impressions all over but i found a couple that were, had really good all five toes on the front because it would dig it dug its front foot its front of its foot into the um the knob as it was going it was like moving back and forth like it was panicked like it there were multiple sets of tracks on top of each other each other from like the same one right but where i saw the one in front of me there was no tracks there but the ground was hard and there was leaves on top of it it was more clay and I, i'm not surprised there wasn't any tracks but then i noticed that right where it stopped and where i stopped hearing it there was a huge pile of broken trees that if it would have kept going through it it would have been a huge crash and massive noise and I didn't hear a sound. So either it just stopped there out of my view and just was silent. I don't know. You know, I don't know what happened to it after it went on my view, but it didn't make a noise, not a sound. Um, but anyway, so I went back and looked for tracks and then I'm still fighting the idea of uh, quitting altogether, but I can't. Um, so I tell you, kind of two things started to happen at the same time when this occurred. I started to go back almost every day for a little while, uh, just to that spot, and I hang up. I put a bucket up in a tree right where I seen it, and I started leaving food out. Tried to establish baiting where I could give them food. They didn't want any of my food, and in fact, about oh, I might have went back there twenty or thirty times, and I would say maybe a third of the times I went back, they were actually there. But they would bark at me like dogs from inside the woods. And and I could tell it sound like humans trying to bark like dogs. They would like, huh, like make noises. And then other do real dogs would start to bark around in houses and stuff. They would like taunt me. But I had a block in me where I couldn't really go any further than just there. I would just stand there 
And one time I was coming out and one jumped out of a tree like 40 feet from me and I heard it run off bipedally, you know, through the brush. And uh, another thing that started happening about that same time is right after this incident occurred, I started to wake up at 3 a.m. every morning. This happened, I would say, two months straight, like 60 times in a row. It was really distinct. Same thing every single time. I would wake up wide awake, out of bed, like boom, and my head would be totally clear, nothing in it. And then these impressions would come into my mind, not words, just impressions. And it was like in third person form. And it would be same thing every time. It would be stop looking for them, stop doing your cameras, stop all of it. And after about the first, you know, 10, 12 times, it got to be a routine. And it was weird. I could, this would happen, and then I would fall back asleep right away. No problem. I wasn't awake. I wasn't like jacked up or nothing it was like this impression at 3 a.m on the dot i'd look at the clock it'd be three o'clock and it would be the same thing stop it and it was in third person so i don't even know who was doing it you know or what what it was and then finally you know like i said after a couple weeks into this it became routine finally i asked well why if i don't stop what's the consequence no consequence expressed i didn't get any response when i asked the question but it wasn't like i was getting a voice it was an impression you understand what I'm saying between the two things? It was no voice. It was like a feelings. It was impression. But I knew exactly what it was. And it was the same thing every time. Kept going. I um, was still doing my thing somewhat, but I was starting to pull back majorly because I just had this intense feeling in me like I had, I was compelled to not do it anymore, even though I was resisting and trying to do it anyways. But as time went on after that fact, I kept pulling back. And, and there was more things that happened that kind of forced me to do that because <clears throat> the Annie kept getting upped I guess you would say on it and they wanted to they started to reveal more to show me more because I think I was the kind of person that they I was smart and they knew I would understand I would get the point I guess of what they were trying to push through to me and so it didn't end there I was woken up at night and I was waiting for it to happen so I could respond or ask questions even and and it wouldn't acknowledge me I'm not important enough to to answer any of my questions I guess you know no consequence expressed nothing like that if you don't quit so it's like okay it's just hanging out there don't do it but if you don't stop we don't, nothing's going to happen anyways at least I don't know so I keep on kind of going but I'm starting to withdraw back and, and um, I pull in from I'm working swing shift and I pull in from the end of my shift one night and the weather was warm it was warm at night it was like 2 a.m that's when I got off and uh, as soon as I opened the door of my car and stepped out as soon as I got both feet on the ground, literally on the other side of the street, which is like 15 feet from me, I get a volume 10 high-pitched Sasquatch scream at me. They're waiting for me to get out of my car right across the street from my house. And this was probably like four months maybe after the incident at Harstein. They, were still wake they had stopped waking me up at that point. That was done, right? I'm not getting woke up at 3 a.m. anymore. But I'm still kind of doing my thing. and So I get screamed at by a Sasquatch right on the other side of my driveway behind some blackberry bushes in the neighbor's yard. So I ignore it, and I just walk in the house like it didn't happen, <laughs> right? It's 2 a.m., everybody's asleep, but it's like as loud as loud can be. It's like as loud as you could turn volume 10 on a stereo. This thing's in my ear, right? It's waiting for me. They're waiting in my house for me to show up. It's like, they we know where you live, right? But how do you find where I live? I don't know. But um, that was one incident. Another incident that happened pretty close in proximity to that one afterwards is my wife calls me one day and my wife is not a Bigfoot person she doesn't never been engaged in research with me or, or had any interest in it whatsoever um, but she calls me one day and lets me know that I mean she's compelled to call me at work on my cell phone in the car and I'm on patrol and she tells me yeah me and Taylor which is my youngest daughter we were just and my daughter was like two at that time or three maybe four and um, she says, we were just sitting in the front yard, and I, n I distinctly noticed these two small rocks bounce right next to me. They were, she said, it like the size of, you know, a nickel. And they were smooth, like they came from the beach. And she doesn't know where they came from, but she was concerned enough that she called me on the phone to just tell me about these two little rocks. And I was like, well... I don't know. I said, was there anybody playing in the bushes? Because there's like bushes all around the house and stuff like that. Where She said, no. Did you hear kids around? And she said, no. And what about somebody running a lawnmower? Could a lawnmower have thrown them? And she said, no. What, I said, did a plane fly over or anything? She said, no. It happened at, like a few seconds apart and these rocks just bounced by me. And I'm like, okay. 
And so I started to think about it and like, is this like a sign to me that they want me to know that they know I have a wife and kids? I'm like, I'm starting to consider this stuff, right? And I'm like, I'm being a little concerned, but I don't want to really acknowledge this stuff so much because this is getting pretty weird. This is real personal now at this point. And um, I guess the, the thing that happened that took me the longest to admit to myself because the significance of it was fairly huge and um, it was too far out for me to really accept it for a while and it took me probably a good year and a half or two after uh, the incident until I would actually even talk about it to anybody. Um, when I would go out to research locations I would always just as a thing on the side randomly I would do this and I would establish it everywhere that I was going to establish any type of long-term research or go back to for a camera or anything. I would just take three sticks crudely and do a teepee structure. And it could be this high or this high, whatever sticks I could find laying around that would hold up together. And then I would do a small one on top and balance it on the top of the three sticks. So I'd have a teepee with a balance stick. And I didn't even tell anybody I was ever doing this. It was just something for me to see if I could get something to you know, communicate back to me with some something similar. Because I know stick structures, I'd seen stuff, and I wasn't big on stick structures, but I had seen enough of it and talked to people that it was something that I was going to utilize as a tool. It's easy to do. It's a way to have communication. So I'm coming home on swing shift this one night. This was after all the rocks and after the scream, but the weather's still warm. I think it was later on in the summer sometime after that. And... Uh, I worked in a big county and depending on where I was at in the county, I wouldn't know. I lived on a loop road, which looped a highway that ran north to south. And the loop road was in, went north to south too. And depending on where I was working in the county would dictate which route I was going to come home, either from the south or the north on that road. And, you know, it was about 10 minutes to the, towards the end of my shift. And so I was on my way home. I was like two miles from my house and I was coming home from the north because that's where I was working. So I wouldn't have known that day until maybe 30, 40 minutes before the end of my shift, which way I was probably coming home. Well, I'm coming down this road and I'm, I'm a couple miles from my house in an area on the north end of Grapeview Loop Road. And I'm coming through this spot where there's a road that intersects to the left. And it's kind of all timber on the sides. So there were some houses on the left and we came into timber. And then just up ahead around the corner, there's like a little bridge that goes over a creek. And I get this, uh, a lot of scotch broom growing in this area on both sides of the road where this intersection is. And I, I got my headlights on. And keep in mind, is <clears throat> I'm in Mason County. I'm not very far from Kitsap County and the Bremerton Shipyard. And a lot of people that live in my area in the north Mason County work at the shipyard. And it's a huge employer, 15, 20,000 people. And um, you can't go even at 2 in the morning on my road, even though it's a rural area. You can't go more than 10 minutes and somebody's going to be driving by either headed north or south. It's, it's a certainty mathematically. 24 hours a day, there's going to be somebody within 10 minutes going one way or the other. So it's never going to be any time period where there's an hour, half hour where nobody drives by. It's always going to be more frequent than that. So I'm coming around the corner and um, it's a nice clear night. Everything's calm. There hasn't been any wind or anything. And I come around the corner in my lane. I look up ahead and there seems like there's debris in the road, right? I start to slow down and come up and right in my lane, first thing I notice is there's a teepee structure, three sticks with a balance stick on top. And around that is a clear area. And then around it, it looks like the weirdest thing. There's broken pieces of Scotch broom all over in the road and they're all pointed in the direction out toward pointing away from the structure. And it's clear for like an eye around the structure for like eight or nine feet in the lane. And then there's debris all around it. Like a tornado touched down in an eye and left this thing here, right? This TV structure. And then there's sticks pointing all, they're all pointing away from it. Like debris, like something tore a scotch broom around and then laid it out all around. And I just stop it in the middle of the road and it's two in the morning. And there's no cars around anywhere, nothing. And I'm like, what in the hell is this? It's like, is somebody screwing with me? I'm like, I'm upset when I saw this. I'm like, this is my structure. And I was like, are some kids watching shows on TV and then doing this? And what's all this debris laying around? And I didn't even want to think about it. I stopped my car, got and I kicked the thing over. And I got back in the car and I drove home and I tried to forget about it. And I didn't talk to anybody about it for a long time. 
And I didn't want to even talk, think about it to myself because the truth of the matter is, is that I knew in the back of my mind that nobody was messing with me. Nobody saw nothing. This was before much stuff like that was even on TV, stick structures or anything like that, possibly being about big. There wasn't much information about it. And this is the exact crude little thing that I would put out. It mirrored exactly the ones that I did, right? And so I kicked this thing over. And I knew right away in my mind, because this is right where my mind went, whatever put this here knew I was going to be at this spot at this time and place before I ever knew. So the truth is, is that whatever did it, doesn't follow the same rules of time and space that we do. It's not accountable to the same laws in physics as us, at least that we think we are. I mean, everything that happened, I would say, and this is the way I took it all, from that stick thing that was in the road, to the scream outside my house, to being woken up at 3 a.m., to the rocks in my wife's yard, to me was a projection of power. Something wanted to show me how powerful that it was and the abilities that it had, right? And it knew that I would understand. And then it forcibly pushed me back out. And even to this day now, I can't, I can't go do real Bigfoot research. Or I, can, I can take people into places and, and walk around and go hiking, but I can't go look for Bigfoot. I just can't. It's in my mind. I, block, I can't do it. You know, I, can't, I can talk about it, but I can't go do it. It's just like it's a rule that I, I have to follow. I have no choice. You know, so that's pretty much the end of that incident and everything until I moved here. And then stuff did happen here too, but I controlled, controlled it, how it happened and when. I wanted to see when I first moved here for about the first eight or 10 months, um, I didn't do anything. I didn't, didn't do any wood knocks. And like I said, I wasn't really doing research anyways, but I wanted to find out if I could draw them in here, if I could call them here. And I did, they didn't never show up on their own. They never came unsolicited, right? They were just not here. And I always, historically there have been reports here, but nothing has happened up here for 20 years before I came. And, and nothing during the time I was here to anybody else. Areas like have high, high Bigfoot areas, they seem to also be high UFO areas or other strange phenomena. But then you also see a migration of people that are more strange, like witches and people that engage in that type of thing and more Earth-type energies. They seem to migrate to the same areas. And it's not related to these other things. It's completely separate. Like this area in particular, you have a migration of these other types of people that come here for a different reason. They're drawn here to an energy too. Maybe it's the same type of energy that draws this other phenomena to be here. Everything is just attracted to it. You know, people that more in touch, more clairvoyant people, more people with abilities or, you know, they may not even know, but they migrate to an area because there's a certain draw to it. It could be the, uh, the minerals in the ground. There's something to the area historically. You know, and I think if you look back in some of these areas like Four Corners region in the middle of the country or the Bridgewater Triangle or Mount Shasta or areas in Alaska where you have weird phenomena that occurs, this happens multi it's it's happens over a long period of time. And in fact, if you really research the areas, you'll find that a lot of the Native American history and stuff even relates to the same type of experiences people are having today in the same places. Disappearances and other stuff was occurring thousands of years ago in the same spots. It's still happening in the same places. So it has something to do with the locations in, on the earth, you know, that, that makes all this stuff manifest or, or, or this stuff happen or these experiences happen. At least it's my point of view, what I believe. <clears throat> I wanted to see if I could draw them here. So what I started to do was, and I figured, okay, the reason why is I had studied this area just like every other area that I studied, you know, I lived here, but I looked at the, you know, the geography, topography around it, historical sightings established that they, that sightings had occurred here, right around where I lived. Everything else is here, the water, the food, they're around here. So I know that based on my own other experiences and, and other research that this was going to follow all the same rules. I just hadn't looked around for them here on purpose yet. And so then I didn't look around, but what I did was just start making my presence known. So what I would do is around the same time every night, maybe five to seven nights a week, I would go around my house and I would go do a wood knock sequence, right? And I would just do it one time. 
and I would do the same sequence. I think it was like two knocks, one knock, and two knocks, or it was one knock, two, and one. I can't exactly remember, but I would do the exact same one, and I wouldn't do it more than once. I would just do it one time, and then I would listen for a while, and then go in the house. And I thought eventually I would get a response back. And I did it for five or six months, and no response, no response. And then finally, I walked down the street down to the creek one day, and I was in the road, and it was about 7 o'clock at night. And we get a lot of gunshots here. Today we're not getting gunshots, but usually there's people shooting all around here, you know, recreationally. They just do it in gravel pits and along the road. That day we didn't have any, but we get them all the time. And you can tell the difference between a gunshot and a wood knock. They're distinctly different. But if you don't know what you're listening for, they could sound the same. So I go down there and I knock, do my sequence. I start walking home and I get about 15 yards from the entrance of my driveway. I get a single wood knock back and it's clear as day and it's coming from that direction, right? Across the road, down probably to, towards the south. Um, not too far away, probably 200 yards. You got to realize wood knocks don't travel that far. So they're not that far away generally, unless you're in an area where sound is amplified or it's happening high above you and you're down low. But on ground like this, where it's pretty flat and actually slopes down away, it can't be coming from too far. I mean, within hundreds of yards. It's not miles, you know, it's fairly close. So if it's close enough to hear me and respond, it's within a few hundred yards from me, probably. A quarter mile, probably, at the very furthest, ha having really good conditions, I would think, you know. Um, distinct knock. So I get to my driveway, and I get on a tree, and I do one knock back, and I get boom, boom. I get two back right away. Um, so I do two back, and I get three back. So I do three in silence, nothing. I don't get a response. And, I'm like, hmm. and I'm, that was for sure wood knock. That was as clear as day wood knock for sure. And I got an answer back. I was interacting and it was over. And that was the first interaction I had during the whole thing, right? So the next day, about the same time, I hadn't wood knocked yet, but then probably right across the street from where we are within 100 yards, you know where we walked earlier today? I get seven consecutive Ohio howls. Have you heard of Ohio howl before? You need to look it up. Matt Moneymaker recorded the Ohio House back in the 90s, and they called Ohio House because it was in Ohio. And what it is, it's a very deep, low-pitched, oh, really long, and then it tapers off towards the end. I got seven consecutive ones that lasted between like seven or eight seconds apiece right across the street from my house, within 100 yards, right? Basically telling, and I was outside in the front yard when it happened, I was like, oh, they're right here, right? And then after that, like I, uh, we had multiple different things happen. Um, my brother was living in a cabin at that time. He would wake up or, or stay up late. He worked shift work, he'd smoke. So he'd go outside and smoke. And then um, he called me on my phone and say, I'm hearing, you know, something knocking rocks together or, or ripping limbs off a tree down behind dad's shop down there. And I'd be like, okay. And he's like, it's going on right now. I've been out here smoking. It's been doing it. It's something banging rocks together. I'd step out the door of my house and he'd say, it just quit. <laughs> you know, step out the door of my house. Like I'm just, and it's 200 yards over that way. So I never heard it. And as soon as he doesn't know I'm stepping out the door, but he said, it just stopped. As we're on the phone together. Right. Okay. And then um, I, I had a couple of different instances in that summer where I had guests over. And um, both different times people were in the house and this was like in the early evening. And we heard like big trees like big big fir trees bigger than these trees you know the biggest ones over here like tree falling down and crashing and shaking the house like a semi truck going off the road and crashing through the trees that loud shake the whole house like almost small earthquake but it sounds like a tree falling down call my dad up tree just fell down it's august there's no wind no nothing we look around the next day of property no tree fell down we heard that happen two times where everybody in the house felt and heard it, but then there was no tree that fell down. It's like in an alternate dimension that a tree did fall down, but we were able to feel it and hear it. Ron Moorhead has a story like that from Sierras. And uh, one night, so they were in their shelter all boarded up and there's Bigfoots were there. Just, they had, their cook station was like 20 yards away from their camp and they can't see it while they're inside their shelter. And they said these things spent, they just destroyed their cook station. She said they smashed all their barrels and their wood stove and everything. And they could hear everything hitting trees. And they went outside and nothing had been touched. So the trees fell down, but there was no trees. And, and this huge noise and sound, I mean, like 
shook the ground, shook the house, big boom, big crash. Sounded just like giant trees getting fell and falling and crashing and hitting the ground. Yet we look around and there's no evidence of it. So it's like, what is the purpose of that? What are they trying to show you? Why is that even happening? You know, and, it, and everybody that was in the house felt it, you know, and everybody, wow, what was that? You know, tree fell down. Well, no trees fell down. So that, you know, that's part of that. And then we had other incidents where my wife was on the back porch one night about two in the morning. We had guests again. She heard something right up behind the house in the brush moving, like crashing through the brush. And she thought it was the dog. And I had a, a different blue healer at the time. And um, she's a good watchdog. So my wife calls the dog. The dog comes out around the front of the house and doesn't even alert to whatever is in the brush moving while the dog's coming, which is totally unlike the dog. It's like not even paying any attention to it. So it's not the dog. And then I go up there the next day and I find big impressions going up the hillside, up through. Um, you know, this, uh, this kind of was an ongoing off and on thing. It would happen periodically where we would hear different stuff. We heard monkey chatter type sounds. Could have been owls up behind the chicken coop one night. My parents did. We're like at four in the morning, actually. They got up early and, and it was going on up there. We've heard other vocalizations, but nothing has happened for quite some time. And, and where it all kind of stopped was it started to stop at, at a certain point in time where I went to Denver to speak at a conference, the Mile High Mystery Conference. And while I was there, there was another conference going on. There was a women's business conference happening in the same hotel. And at the last night that we were there, we were drinking with some other people and then there was other people drinking. We end up in this group where there was like three or four women from this conference with a bunch of the Bigfoot people that were there. We were talking and, and I was talking to this woman, she was named Elaine. And she's actually a, 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 a clairvoyant, she's a medium. And her business is she works on referral only and she is a fertility medium. And, and what she does is connect couples that wanna get pregnant with souls that wanna be born. And she has like a 90% success rate. She only works on referrals and she gets, I don't know, she told me, it's like 20 grand. It was back, she, she lives in Hawaii now. She lived in New Mexico. She makes a lot of money. She's really good at what she does. And it's a lot of people that fail medically through getting help and they come to her and then have success. Um, I end up meeting her there and she tells me, oh, I can tell that you have a purpose and all this stuff. And, and she ends up, end up talking to me later about some other issues that I had had related to, uh, I felt like, you know, people were trying to draw my energy off me or something like that. She said, oh, I can help you with that. I can teach you some stuff. And she says that I'll give you a free Skype session, a couple of them, and I'll give you some skills where you can learn to do this stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm pretty open-minded. So I did. And then like the, the second one that I, I had did with her, she stops it during the meeting. She says, there's somebody here in my office that is trying to talk to me about you. And she says, I'm not sure what it is actually. And she stops talking to me for a while. And then she comes back and she said, there's some, she said, these are Bigfoots actually that are here in my, there's one here in my office. And uh, it's actually a Bigfoot that lives close to where you live. And he's here talking to me and he wants me to help you to learn how to communicate with him remotely and she says you know how to you can do it you have ability to do it you just don't know how but i can show you and he wants me to help you learn how and then she went on to pass on information to me for, through him about stuff around my house which was true so i actually try do a few of these sessions with her to learn how to remote communicate and i did everything like i was supposed to do and it didn't really work for me and it probably was something to do with me you know but but there was something else simultaneously going on at the same time as her, there was another woman named Michael that lives at my, Mount Adams that I was in contact with through the North American Ape Project through David Politis. And uh, actually, Les Stroud had been to see this woman. I don't know if he had been there. Oh, no, one time he had been there before I got invited. So I made that YouTube video on Harstein Island, and this woman saw it. Well, some Bigfoot saw it, too, through her or with her. And they wanted to talk to me, right? The Bigfoots had Michael contact me. This is, I know it's very strange. So she starts to get in contact with me directly through email. And she tells me, you know, yeah, Les Stroud's been here a few times. He's never told anybody he's gone there. Allegedly, he's had 
I don't know if he's seen him face to face, but he's had at least verbal contact with Bigfoots there because that's what happens when you go to this place. Richard went there, him and his wife from California, and they had Bigfoot contact four nights in a row. They wouldn't see him, but they could actually see him in the brush line where the bushes would move when they'd come down the hillside. And then they would they could hear him verbally talking in the brush and then they would communicate through Michael through MindSpeak and then relay information, but they would give cues from verbally outside. It was very odd. He had no doubt about it. They invited me to this place. As Michael was giving me the same, she was also communicating with me and telling me that there were Bigfoots at my house that wanted to talk to me. Same time as Elaine, but these two women weren't communicating with each other. But they were both telling me stuff, especially Michael was giving me details, especially the spot we're sitting at right now. She actually, Michael emailed me one night because when we were, they were doing logging here in this area, there was equipment here and there was a log, logs piled up here. And some people feared that there might be vandalism in this spot because people are real touchy, you know, especially a forest like this where they see any activity going on. So I set up some game cameras here. I got an email from Michael. I never mentioned anything to her. And she said, hey, I had a, they wanted me to contact you to let you know that you don't have anything to worry about where that work is going on next to your house where that equipment is over there and nothing's going to happen she said, there's nothing's going to happen bad any at all right you don't have to worry and i was like that's way too much information and then she goes on to tell me through other emails how they sit up behind my house and they watch me through my windows and she described the inside of my house and they wanted to also okay this is something my wife has epilepsy and I haven't told anybody this. This is the first time right here that I'm going to tell anybody. They wanted to know this. And it was too personal for me that I haven't, I've been not sleeping in the same bed as my wife for a long time, for a couple of years, because of the fact she doesn't sleep well and she's on meds, especially at night where she can't be disturbed. They wanted to know why I wasn't sleeping in the same room. <laughs> they asked through Michael. They wanted to know why, because they seen that I wasn't they knew right and then eventually I pulled back out of this and I, I put out some ultimatums where something it wasn't happening it was very persistent coming from two angles at once like these things really wanted to talk to me and um they had been in my house before too she had said but she said I could stop that if I wanted to I could just tell them it wasn't okay and at that time I wasn't sure I said well I don't whatever <laughs> you know but they had been, she described my entire inside of my house from Mount Adams to me through them telling her everything and my whole property. And later I went up and looked behind my house and I found where they had been watching me from. <clears throat> There's a spot up there where I'd found where they had sat and there was kind of some sticks stacked up in different places. And there's a spot where I could show you, but we don't, I don't really actually want you to put my house on camera, but behind my house up above on the hill, there's a spot where there's ce small cedar trees they are all pushed down in a circle. And they were all broken over. And then there's another one where there was two trees next to each other. And there's a, um, one of them's bent over and the top broken out of the other. And it was a fork top and it stuck in with a fork next to it and pushed the other one into the ground. And they're only that far apart. So there's no way that could have happened without something doing it. And I found what looks like a bed up there and stuff too, where one had been laying down right up behind my house. So ultimately how this all ended and everything stopped was I got frustrated because I was going through this process and Look, I'm out here in the woods every day. I'm non-threatening, and I'm not going to hurt these things if they want to come up to me. And they're, they're, they're really trying to contact me through a couple of different mediums. You know, I know that it's legitimate based on the information. I'm trying to help make it happen, but it isn't happening for some reason. And then finally, one day, I go outside and I project out that, hey, look, you know, I'm fully open to this, and I, I don't understand why you guys just can't come up to me face to face. How come it has to go through a third party and teach me how to talk to you remotely when you're looking in my windows and you know everything that's going on and you're asking me questions about my family and telling me not to worry about what's going on and what troubles me over here? You know, don't worry about this stuff. And how come you just can't meet me face to face? And I basically said that. I'm willing to do any communication. The truth is I won't relinquish any. I'm not giving anything up to do this. And that was the end. It all stopped. And I'll tell you that when they were around here, it was like a dark cloud. It was like no animals. It, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel right. You know, that's just my impression, my feeling. And now it's gone. And there's never been really anything significant since. You know, nothing I can say for sure. Not like it was. 
I don't have any issues. I'm not afraid to go out in the woods anymore or anything like that. But all I said is I'm not giving anything up. I'm not relinquishing anything, you know, and that was the end of it. It's like I had to give something up to keep going and I wasn't willing to. And I don't know what it was. It started the day that when it walked across the road in front of my car and then it pushed me on this path of challenging everything and questioning everything and thinking for myself and being betrayed by my own government and, and, and the system that I dedicated my life to. And then it started to open my eyes. I started seeing everything that was in plain sight that people, other people weren't seeing. You know, I can sit back during COVID and watch and, and not be involved kind of like as a spectator. And I get to see just how people just sheep. They just, they don't know. They're just doing what they're told. They're just being controlled, you know. You know, kind of, and I'm just watching. I'm not being controlled by the same thing. I'm just, I'm on the outside looking in. But I get to watch everybody else. You know, I'm like, I walk a parallel path as an observer, kind of as a way that I feel. I'm not really, I'm different. I don't have a lot of friends. You know, I don't. I stick close to home. I have, I'm with my family. I don't have many friends at all. You know, I don't want, I don't really want any friends. You know, I just don't. It's got to be like three years probably since anything has happened at all. Yeah, probably at least three, three to four. Yeah, because my dog's four and nothing's happened since I've had her, I don't think at all. I suspected a couple of things, but then I didn't have any way to really confirm it. I had an egg go missing once that I could have been a bird that grabbed it though too. Because nothing happened after. I thought it was them, but then I'm like, nah. Because I put some eggs out just in my yard. Just to see what would happen. But then, I'm sure they come through here still, but I'm not a point of interest anymore for whatever reason. You know, they don't bother me. I don't have it here. I, don't, I haven't heard any. I've heard what I thought maybe was some distant wood knocks here and there, but I haven't tried to answer anything back. or I don't want to engage. I just don't want to. You know, it's like I, I, people want me to go with them and stuff. Maybe I just feel like I get amused as bait, to be honest with you. So it's like, why? I mean, I've seen them twice. I don't really want to see them again. And it's not, I, I already know they're real. I'd rather just not. Nothing really has good has come out of, I mean, it is good, I would say, but I don't, it just doesn't feel like positive experience, any of it. The first time I saw the Harstein experience wasn't positive either. I was intimidated. I got, I feel like, like you said, I was, it's a powerful being and it wants to let me know how powerful it is. And I was, somehow I, I scared them enough or I was persistent enough that they, they were concerned with me enough to expose to me a little bit more than they exposed to most people. They knew that I wouldn't give up and I'd be persistent unless they really sent it home. So they went as far as they could without making me disappear, I think. You know, really. Because they showed themselves to me, they vocalized to me, they projected fear into me, strongly, dread, and then they showed me that they have the ability to locate me without following me home. They can wake me up in my dreams if they want to. And then they can defy the rules of time and space to get their point across if they want to. What else can do those kind of things? What else can they do? <laughs> you know, I don't know. But I don't really want to find out too much either. I mean, because they were pointing, everything was pointed directly at me. It was to get my attention to let me know, look, we can do this. We can do this. It wasn't that that information was given to me to divulge out to everybody else. It was meant to change my behavior somehow or another or that's what my impression was so I mean I'm all like yeah now just because I've talked too much and it's just about it and I'm all you know jacked up right now you know my body's tense well yeah yeah no 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 I won't say nothing positive this thing has all been really positive I'm just saying the the incidents in themselves how it manifested out didn't feel good or positive it was all fear and dread and black cloud and it's just something else you know uh, it's not that at all but I have gone through an awakening as a result of it you know from the very beginning and I do think the first Bigfoot sighting was responsible for my path in life changing ultimately and pushing me to some sort of purpose and now I think that my purpose is to help awaken people in one way or another just to let them know that things are not as they appear there's something else going on you know, what we organically live in this little, you know, 
thing of whatever it is. It's not really the world and it's not really life, what it is that we're experiencing here. We're distracted from something else that's happening all around us, but we're not engaging with it for some reason. I've engaged partially, but most people don't engage. They don't even know it's there. I mean, I was forced into engaging somehow, some way or another. It was meant for me to happen. Some of us, I guess, are given this. It's a gift, I guess you would say, because it starts to transform you. You know, I don't think it's a random thing. It, it transforms you to where you start to perceive everything in a different way. And by doing so, you start to see things that other people do not see, right? Stuff that's plain is sight, plain to you. It's just right there, but no one else can see it. I can just see it, you know? And I'm not talking about I'm seeing things that don't exist. I'm talking about what people are doing, what the cause it is. I see a bigger picture going on than what they see, you know? And I think that's all related to my experience. And it was all meant to happen that way. You know, maybe I was meant to be pushed a little bit so I could push other people a little bit more, you know, because that's what my path has been. I have told people my story about being a whistleblower, about Bigfoot, whatever, without any fear of ridicule or being nervous about it. I mean, sometimes, you know, people laugh at you and you're nervous afterwards, but it doesn't stop me. I just tell them. I'm not, I don't have fear of it. I don't care what they think. It's just my job to tell them and they can... They can laugh if they want to, but I put, I planted that seed. I put it in there related to whatever I want to tell them about. I can plant seeds and they can not want to believe it or they can laugh at it or not want to accept it, but the seed's been planted already. It's too late. It's going to grow and fester in there and they're going to hear other things and they're going to recall what I said to them and they're going to relate that back and it's all going to start. It may take 20 years from the time I had a conversation and it might all come together and they might say, oh yeah, I remember. Because I can tell you that when I have... When I talk to people, they remember the contact with me usually because the conversation that we have is meaningful, even if they don't know me. It just is the way it is. Coming from a, a law enforcement and a military background and being the fact that I do think of things in the big picture and I always consider all aspects of it. One thing that I know through my experience is this. The United States government, if there is an undocumented humanoid that's roaming around North America, it's going to view that as a threat to national security because it's outside the control of the U.S. government, right? They want to control everything, right? It is their agenda to control everything that's within the bounds of this country and outside. They want to control the whole world, ultimately, right? And they do, ultimately, financially and militarily. So if there's an undocumented humanoid living in North America, and obviously with the thousands of encounters that's occurred since prehistory, that's well established that there is. I mean, it means that they would dedicate and exhaust all available resources to find out as much information as possible about that undocumented humanoid that's outside of their control and which is a threat to national security. It, it's by definition a threat to national security. They would use all resources and exhaust all of them to find out everything they possibly could about it. I have no doubt whatsoever that they've done that. And I think the proof in that that they have done that is the fact that we have all these researchers out here that are amateur researchers, and some of them have pretty fantastic encounters or have found massive amounts of inf information. In fact, I was engaged in a DNA study that we didn't talk about at all for five years where we identified 111 individuals. I can tell you that no Bigfoot researcher that I know of, even, even some of the ones that are scientists that are paid as professional Bigfoot researchers, because there are, are some that are professionals that do it on the side, like Jeff Meldrum and other people, to any of these amateur researchers that have vast knowledge or vast experience or vast research that they put together has been contacted by a government agent that wanted to know the information that they had or what they knew, which tells me that the information that they already have is much greater than anything that we know. So they don't need to talk to any of us to find out anything more because they know enough, right? They know as much as they can ever find out based on the technology and the resources they have available to them, right? So they don't need to talk to us, which tells you that they, the other fact of the matter is that there's been no disclosure pretty much related to Bigfoot when it comes for the government. The only disclosure that's out there and it's supposed to be allegedly tongue in cheek is there's a uh, Army Corps of Engineers book that came out in the 60s where they mention Sasquatch and they give information related to it to people that might encounter them related to the military. And they say it was tongue-in-cheek how that was all put out. 
I think maybe it was soft disclosure. Who knows? Um, but that's it. And in fact, if you do a freedom of information request, say for UFOs from the U.S. government, I guarantee you over a period of time, if you r requested all applicable records for UFO, you'd probably get millions and millions of documents, many of them redacted, right? But I guarantee you that if you do an F freedom of information request for Sasquatch, you're going to get very little to nothing, meaning they're not divulging any information that they know on that topic, meaning they're willing to on UFO, but they're not willing to say anything on Sasquatch. So I used to talk to Meldrum all the time. I, I probably talked to him at least an hour a week on the phone. We used to, I talked to him directly. He was talking to me all, all the time we were talking. He was interested in what we were doing. Um, and he had told me that uh, he was good friends in the 90s with the uh, head scientist for Olympic National Park. He oversaw all scientific research, biologists, everything for the park. He was friends with him at that time. and He had regular contact with him. The head scientist of Olympic National Park had a, a Class A sighting himself in the Wainuchi drainage where he saw one. He thought it was an elk coming down a trail, and so he got off to the side of the trail. He thought he was going to have a close encounter with an elk, so he hid in the bushes, and a Bigfoot walked like three feet from him, and he saw it clear from the knees down to the feet. He walked right by him. This was the, the head scientist for an Olympic National Park. And then he goes on to tell me that, yeah, not just that, he had at least three of his employees that had Class A sightings who were at least field-level biologists that had Class A sightings of Bigfoots in the Olympic National Park. Yet their official stance of the U.S. government is they don't exist, right? So what does that tell you? I mean, they know everything there is to know about them. And then they, I don't know that he knew everything, but he had a sighting. But let me ask you, if you're a scientist and you work for the U.S. government and you have a sighting of a cryptid like a Bigfoot, don't you think you want to do something to establish, you know, an official record of it to somebody? I mean, when I was a cop in La Push, I was a cop. I just had a Bigfoot sighting. I made it well known to the county. They all knew. Nobody from the feds came down to talk to me or interview me about it. But I can tell you that Within like two weeks, I had my Bigfoot sighting. There was a UFO sighting in La Push, right above James Island, where there were like 12 witnesses, and they got it on the Coast Guard radar. And the FBI was down there the next day, and they told everybody that they saw some experimental helicopter over the top of James Island. It was like at midnight, and they saw this disshaped object with lights around it hover right down on the island and then take off. And uh, they were down there the next day. They knew right away. But they didn't come down for a Bigfoot sighting, but they came down for a UFO sighting. Even though a cop had seen the Bigfoot, but nobody came down for that. So I, I don't know, you know. But yeah, I, I think that they know everything that there is po possibly to kn possible to know. I mean, look at Skinwalker Ranch. And the government had massive resources in there for a decade. Scientists, Department of Defense was in there. They had everything. You, they had, there's books written by government scientists that were able to disclose some of the information out of that place. So have you guys know about Skinwalker? Yeah. Well, that's related to the cattle stuff and all that, yeah. Well, you know, based on the DNA and what we saw and what the experiences are and stuff like that, I, I think that uh, the closest thing that I can relate them to, if you look at history and what documentation are, is in, I think the Bible has the most information maybe related to Bigfoot description with giants and hairy, hairy beings like Esau and other stuff. And, um, and I think that Based on ability and stuff, they might be Nephilim. They might be what the Enoch, the Bible describes as Nephilim, which would have been descendants of uh, a race that was a cross between angels and man. You know, something like that. I know the DNA that we did shows, you know, that it's a hybrid species, you know, and they were easily able to show that, that it was a hybrid. It's a, it's a cross between um, uh, modern human females and an unknown male and and they also know based on the dna they can tell by the haplogroup so they know when the intervention happened around the time frame they can see the window and it's not that long ago 12 to twenty thousand years ago is when it happened that's when sasquatch became what it is only that far back they figure and it happened in multiple areas of the world at around the same time right but most of the it happened in eastern europe caucus mountains area that's where the, most of the haplogroups groups are from. And the haplogroup group is the female lineage. They can show the original female lineage through the mitochondrial DNA. And it shows the origination point of where the mixing happened, where the unknown mixed with the known. And you can see 
the time window. And you can look at the Genome Project to get more information on that. So we were in perpetual peer review with Nature for like a year and a half, where they leaked information, they tried to undermine some of the people, scientists involved in the study. Uh, they did everything they could, it seemed, to derail it and to delegitimize the whole process. We waited for a year and a half for them to publish it, and they reassured us early on that, oh yeah, it's gonna pass peer review, no problem, because there was like 10 different either, there I don't know how many labs. There was a whole bunch of labs that did blind testing for that study, and they were all forensic crime labs through states, or they were college universities. And um, she sent them blind stuff, so they didn't know what they were testing. And some of them fight, figured it out because they were asking a lot of questions because they figured out that it was a new species pretty early on while they were doing testing. And they were only testing certain parts of the DNA, so they were getting incomplete pictures of it. But anyhow, nature tried to screw us essentially on purpose, trying to basically derail the whole thing to make sure that it wasn't ever going to get seen by anybody. So they canceled with nature. They went with somebody else, and for six more months we were in peer review. And then they finally pulled out of that scene. The writing was on the wall. And uh, they bought their own journal. Wally Anderson bought the journal so they could publish the paper, and then they closed the journal. So they self-published. So it does. it's semi not legitimate because it's a self-published paper. And it, all the data's on there. There's been quite a few scientists that have come out in Genesis that have backed it up now, but it doesn't go anywhere. I did it. We did a big press release in Dallas. It's online. You probably, I'm part of it. But uh, you'd have to search through the press release to, to see my parts where I speak. I'm in a burgundy shirt and gray pants. You got to realize in the Bigfoot community, the worst enemy of discovery and divulging any Bigfoot is the Bigfoot people themselves. So many of them destroy everything and, and fight each other and then, and then try to destroy each other. It's just a huge, you know, everybody is uh, competitive with it. And I don't know if it's like that anymore. I don't really engage, but, but I suspect it's probably similar to the same thing. Nobody wants anybody to discover anything. Nobody wants anybody to get anywhere. Anytime you put any evidence out or you see any video, none of it matters anymore because it just gets debunked. Even if it's real, it's debunked anyways. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. You know, it's just nothing's legitimate. You know, that's my experience with the whole thing. I think Bigfoot researchers' biggest enemies are themselves, to be honest with you. Not all of them, but some of them in general. It seems to be that way. And I don't know if it's still that way or, or if it's changing more. But it used to be, it seemed like. <laughs>